familiar with this initiative. It's only been around a couple of years, and its focus really is to try to find novel solutions to food, real world food systems problems. And we do that by engaging researchers in cross disciplinary ways. Sorry, I got close that for me. Um, in cross disciplinary ways across this unique and very large institution, trying to find strategic opportunities to actually come to solutions via uh, research and novel research and innovative research. We also do this through education and outreach activities. Uh, for example, last year we held a small scale farming workshop which reached farmers and advocates across five states in the Southwest. We do this internationally. We were in Senegal a couple of years ago with workshops on youth engagement and technological innovation in farming. Um, so anything where we can have partnerships that involve food, health, and livelihoods is what FSTI is involved in. So if you want to learn more about FSTI, you can visit us online at Food Systems, that's plural, so foodsystems.asu.edu, and you can also contact us via email through that site as well. So thanks very much. I'm going to turn it over to Joshua who will introduce Bart. Hi, I've been told to speak up. Can you hear me? Um, so I'd like to thank Food Systems Transformation Initiative and Dr. Chris Wharton, as well as GEOS and the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, my colleague Chris Jones, a historian there, uh, all of who helped bring uh, Dr. Bart Elmore here for this lecture. Dr. Elmore is an assistant professor at The Ohio State University and a recently minted Carnegie Fellow at New America. Before that, he was a postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley and an assistant professor at the University of Alabama. He hails from Atlanta, which is where he de first developed an interest in food systems, and in particular the soft drink giant, Coca-Cola. His first book, Citizen Coke, which I have here, uh, The Making of Coca-Cola Capitalism, has won numerous awards, was recently reissued as a paperback, and it is now the subject, apparently, of a new documentary forthcoming. So for those of you not familiar with the usual outcomes of the academic book market, Citizen Coke has officially reached rock star status become the real thing in historical writing. One of the reasons Dr. Elmore's work is so important is because it articulates the long run social and ecological problems that occurred at the juncture of what many historians have been exploring in two very popular new uh, fields, the history of capitalism and environmental history. But these two fields have not been very uh, well interconnected until now with books like this and with his new work. Dr. Elmore looks at how companies organized and reorganized their businesses and how they interacted with natural resources, or in the case of Coca-Cola, how they pioneered the outsourcing of those interactions to other companies. And as one of the central questions of Citizen Coke puts it, how did Coca-Cola build a global empire by selling low-priced concoctions that are made of mostly sugar, water, and caffeine? I think we'll see many similar lines of uh, analysis with his work today on Monsanto. His fellowship at New America um, is allowing him to do new research for this new book on Monsanto, which has the wonderful title of Seed Money, How the Monsanto Company's Quest for Power Remade Our World. And in his abstract, Dr. Elmore uh, promised to dig up some dirt on phosphorus mining for glyphosate. So I will take the liberty in that vein of rounding up a few questions afterwards and being ready to moderate them. I'll try not to modify the DNA of most of your questions, but at the same time, I'll try to keep us on track, non-toxic, and out of the weeds. Uh, well, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I want to thank the Food Systems Program and the Wrigley uh, Institute, uh, Chris, Jones, who uh, really, we started this process of thinking about this talk a while back, and uh, Chris, a historian here, environmental historian here, has become a really close friend, and just kind of wonderful to be here with him. And Josh and Sydney uh, has also worked behind the lines to make sure this all went off so well, so thanks for all of that. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my sister, Lisa, who's here, and a close family friend, Shannon, who have known me since I was in diapers, and I think uh, they even changed some of my diapers. <laughs> So it's got to be a really weird experience to hear me talk today, because they knew me when I couldn't talk. Um, so, so wonderful to have family and friends all here today. What I'd like to do is kind of uh, do three things in the talk this afternoon. And start with kind of an origin story of how it is that I decided to write a global environmental history of the Monsanto Company. And my goal in telling you that origin story is to show you that I'm not insane. 
and that I thought there was a reason I could do this, even though it's kind of a big, big project that's already um, going in so many different directions. So I'm going to tell you kind of the origins of how I came to study Monsanto. And then um, in the middle kind of meat of the talk, I want to talk about, you know, one chapter of the book that I've kind of finished so far, still working on, which is one of the reasons I'm here is to hear input on the history of Roundup, which is, of course, uh, Monsanto's best-selling herbicide, uh, one of their biggest money makers, uh, even today. And, and here you can actually see on the cover here of this talk, this is the facility where the beginnings of Roundup production begins in southeast Idaho, uh, near Soda Springs, Idaho. And I'll try and explain what you're seeing here, this floral arrangement, in a little bit. So I'm going to try and tell you a story as we get kind of to the middle of all of this and, um, and show you some of the findings that I've uncovered there. And then at the end, I think what would be really fun to do with a lot of smart minds in the room is to save a ample time for kind of a conversation about uh, sustainable agriculture um, in, in light of some of the things I'll be talking about and kind of have a, a back and forth um, regarding some of those issues. So three things today, kind of origins, a roundup discussion and then uh, discussion amongst ourselves about sustainable agriculture. So origins, how did I come to try and write about the Monsanto company? The truth is it started a long time ago when I first started researching uh, this project on Coca-Cola as a graduate student at the University of Virginia. And I started this project, an environmental history of the Coca-Cola company, because I'd grown up in Atlanta, Georgia, in Coke country. And uh, Lisa can attest to this, and Shannon can attest to this. I think I drank, you know, two or three Cokes a day and was obsessed with this drink, kind of thinking about it, and was always stunned by its global reach. And this is uh, Citizen Coke, as I like to call him, by the way, on the cover of Time magazine in 1950, and I think it's really emblematic of the fact that by 1950, Coca-Cola was already, you know, globally dominant uh, around the world. And so for about seven years, it's crazy to think about, I have traveled around the country and the world, going to India and Peru, um, looking at the environmental footprint of this business, and that's kind of what I'm interested in. I'm an environmental historian who likes to look at big corporations and think about transnational uh, history and the effects of businesses on the environment and the ways in which the environment shapes businesses. And this project was really driven by a very, very, very simple question, which was WTF, right? Like, like how did that happen? How is it that an obscure patent medicine from my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, which started as a brain tonic, and the advertising was, this thing will eliminate brain worry, which I feel like all of us have, right? And who wouldn't drink this? Um, you know, how did that thing, that obscure sugar water, which was actually originally a wine, interestingly, end up doing this, conquering the world in 190 countries worldwide? And it strikes me, it's, when I talk about Coke, I'll give you some, you know, cocktail party fun facts. The company today says that it sells 1.8 billion servings of its products every single day. 1.8 billion servings. So as somebody who is interested in sustainability and the history of sustainability, I wanted to get at that. How did they do that? You know, and most histories of Coca-Cola have been written by journalists, and they focused on the story of marketing and advertising, right? It was the cuddly polar bears and the, you know, the smiling GIs or, or even Santa Claus who connects Coca-Cola to you know, consumers and, and, and makes people think of Coke and happiness. And that's true. There's no doubt their advertising was really a, a strong part of that. But as an environmental historian, I want to think about the materialities of Coke. Okay, that's great. You have these great advertisements, but how do you get all that sugar? Coke boasted that it was the largest sugar consumer on the planet by the 1920s. And it was the largest consumer of processed caffeine in the world by mid-century. Lots and lots of stuff, natural resources. And the question became, 
how do they get all that stuff at such low cost? But they could literally be everywhere, 190 countries today. And so I was, Chris also knew me kind of back in this phase. I was somewhat of a lazy graduate student. And so I came up with a simple organizational scheme to tell this story. I ripped the back of a Coke container and made that my table of contents. So the idea was, okay, let's look at each ingredient that goes into Coke and its secret formula and talk about the environmental footprint of all those things. Water, um, of course, sucrose sugar blew up into multiple chapters, aspartame and high fructose corn syrup, and that was a big mess. I could have talked about all the natural flavors, but I never would have gotten my degree because there's so many natural flavors, so I decided to focus on the coca leaf. Uh, because of Coca-Cola and the significance of that trade with Peru, which incidentally continues into the 21st century. The cocaine was removed, but the coca leaf remained. And I'm not talking about Coca-Cola today, but uh, you know, in the book, I go down to Peru with my father, actually, who acted as my kind of bodyguard, even though he was a Alabaman that spoke very little sp Spanish, and uh, I think probably caused more trouble then, uh, you know, where are the cocaeros? Where are the coca farmers? They're providing drugs and all this, you know. Uh, Lisa knows my dad, so I think she understands. But so it was an interesting journey down all these different paths. And I looked at caffeine. And that's where I want to kind of transition to the conversation today. The question was, how did they get all that stuff? And when I got to caffeine, I got to say, I was really stumped. I, at first, I thought, where does. Coke get their caffeine from. And it turns out that it was Monsanto. And that in the early 20th century, the Monsanto Chemical Company, we know of Monsanto today as a company based out of St. Louis, Missouri, that is a genetically modified seed company. Well, in the beginnings, it was really a chemical company. And Coke was one of its biggest buyers of its chemicals of caffeine, and actually initially saccharin, the artificial sweetener as well. We think of Diet Coke and artificial sweeteners just later, but Coke, Coke actually adulterated their earlier products because it was cheaper to use saccharin until people started saying, we don't like saccharin, right? And, and started asking questions about what was in the formula. So Monsanto provided the caffeine and provided the saccharin for Coca-Cola. And this is the participatory part of the early section of the talk. What would you guess when you think about caffeine is the answer? Where did Monsanto source when we think about the natural resource? Where would you guess the caffeine came from? And if, if you have read the book, it's obviously in there, but if you, if you haven't, what would be your guess regarding that? Any guesses about where the caffeine? And, and you'd be spot on. It was a waste product, and it was a waste product of the tea industry. It was actually waste tea leaves. That's what they were called. Broken and damaged tea leaves that were left on the floor of tea exchanges because this was tea that people didn't like. They liked to steep it and see the tea, and they wanted good quality tea. So it was discarded tea leaves. Which is remarkable. And Monsanto was smart about this. It was really recycling waste from other industries. They said, well, okay, if people don't want to drink that tea, we'll sweep it up and turn it into caffeine, a very powerful drug, and sell it to Coke. And it was a really cheap way of doing it because, look, it's, it's refuse, right? That's part of the story. The story got more interesting because Coca Cola needed more caffeine. And ultimately, the tea industry said, you know what, those consumers aren't as smart as we think they are. Let's just put those waste tea leaves in tea bags like we see today. And you know what, we can market some of that waste. And that waste became a branded commodity that the tea industry started gobbling up. And Coke was really worried, and Monsanto was too. So where do you get your caffeine by the 1950s? And the answer there is decaf coffee. So if you've ever wondered where all that caffeine goes, from decaf coffee, right? It was actually Maxwell House. Uh, and this, this is the fun thing about this journey, was kind of asking these questions and pursuing those, those answers. And it was actually Maxwell House decaf coffee. 
that was funneling, the, the caffeine that was taken out from that decaf was sold to Coca-Cola. And by the way, Coke dumps Monsanto's contract. So thanks a lot, but we're moving on. And Monsanto, these great letters in the archives say, wait a minute, man, we've had this long history. And you know, Robert Woodruff, the boss of the company, says it's just business, you know. Uh, just to, it's just because it's interesting and it's fun group in the, in the crowd. Uh, that's not the end of the story. Coke needed even more. And ultimately, they switched to synthetic caffeine. And that's the most interesting because that comes from originally synthetic caffeine came from coal tar. And today is processed from natural gas. Um, I think urea is one of the base molecules that they use in this um, fossil fuel feedstock to produce methylate and produce caffeine. And this is where synthetic caffeine comes from. Coke originally didn't want to do it. And in the archives, it's really funny because they say the base molecule is urea. Sounds too much like urine. And people are going to abandon us, you know. And then they decide, you know what? People aren't asking where our caffeine comes from. Let's source it. So today, when you go to their website, it'll say, Coke sources their caffeine from tea leaves, waste tea leaves, uh, from coffee beans, decaf coffee, and appropriate sources. And the appropriate sources is fossil fuels. And largely China is where this is processed today, natural gas. That was more than I wanted to do, but I think it's actually kind of interesting to think about these journeys. And, and in this case, Monsanto was really compelling to me. I got to know Monsanto by studying that caffeine relationship. And as a historian, what I came to find was that there, this was a really serious relationship. If you go to Monsanto's website, they actually say, we would not exist but for Coca-Cola. So when you think about the environmental footprint of businesses, I actually think it's interesting to think about Coke and the existence of Monsanto, right? Uh, these, the, the footprints of these firms sometimes extend further than just their own the, uh, things that they're producing, but the relationships they create and the businesses they build, Monsanto said this. And so I got really obsessed at this point, and I discovered that there was actually, this is pretty remarkable for anybody who's studying the history of Monsanto, they have over uh, you know, 600 linear feet of archival material at the Washington University in St. Louis. And that's where as a historian I said, okay, I might have a shot at this. Now this has been, you know, trust me, they've gone through this and tried to clean out a lot of probably nasty stories. For example, one of the plants where they produced Agent Orange, you'd think it was just a place where people played baseball and all the employees were happy, right? True story is those employees ended up with debilitating diseases. And that's one of the chapters I'm writing about now. But the point is, as a historian, it provided a base. And I was able to kind of use this archive to start telling stories about Monsanto. And so that's, that, that leads me to the meat of the talk today. Okay, so, so I've been kind of going through these archival resources filing Freedom of Information Act requests, going to places doing interviews um, about this company. And one of the chapters that's been really most compelling has been this chapter on Roundup. Um, and that's what I want to talk about, kind of tell you a story for the remainder of the time I have. So I do this with my students, and you don't have to do this, but if you would indulge me, close your eyes for a second. And I want you to kind of imagine you're with me last summer in June. You're, you're with me, and it's, it's, it's about 9 o'clock at night, dusk. And we're in southeast Idaho, this vast expanse of land kind of sits out before us. And you can see these kind of mountains in the distance, and the sun's setting over those mountains. Okay, And if you're with me that night, you're on top of a pickup truck next to a barbed wire fence watching as the sun sets. And this is what's right in front of your gaze. You can open your eyes and you can see what, where I had just arrived. Okay. This is nighttime. Getting towards nighttime. It looks like daytime. And that's partially because of the brightness of that thing that's being dumped right there. Here's a barbed wire fence, we're on top of a pickup truck, and we're looking at an active Superfund site. And you might say to yourself, an active Superfund site, that's interesting. A Superfund site, a toxic 
site of pollution declared so by the EPA that usually means it should be shut down and cleaned up. But that is in full operation in southeast Idaho. And less than 100 feet away, we were standing there documenting with a photographer the dumping of phosphate slag. And this is the byproduct of processing phosphate ore, phosphate rock, uh, into elemental phosphorus, which is the key ingredient in glyphosate, Roundup. And this is how it's produced at Monsanto's facility, which has been declared a Superfund site that is currently allowed to operate. This is at 9 o'clock at night, and this is being dumped. Now, at this point, I had to be honest with you, I felt a little sick. Because we had just met with a radiological scientist in Pocatello, Idaho, just down the road, who had told us that phosphate slag contains large quantities of radium, and that this material gives off low doses of gamma rays, is radioactive waste. We had been assured that that level of radiation is very low, and that it wasn't something we should be particularly concerned about. But I have to tell you, as an academic that usually sits in Dusty Archives, this was less than academic at this point, considering where we were. And considering the next couple of shots that we took, you know, I said we didn't know what was going to happen. We're just seeing these cauldrons of waste being dumped. And the reason you're seeing this, this is, you know, this was over 100 feet, 200 feet high. Of the, our shot is us kind of zoomed in, but this was just a mountain of this waste, which is just piling up because you can't do anything with it because it's essentially toxic waste. And this was the next shot. And at this point, I remember looking over to John, my friend, and said, maybe this is a bad idea. <laughs> and it got a little bit crazier as we kind of sat there, and we're at a barbed wire fence. And by the way, there's farmland and children that can play just right here behind us. Um, and we got shots of that the next day. Um, it got a little crazier as it comes down. It was like the sun. I mean, literally, this went on at 10 o'clock at night. It lit up the entire area, region. You could see the mountains around here. Yeah. We, uh, it's, it's just out there. We, we actually uh, done some research in, in advance, had determined that this is where the elemental phosphorus for Roundup was produced. And I said, I'll go out there. Small town of 3,000 people, so to Springs, right over here. And uh, I don't think a lot of people go out there because it's kind of off the beaten path, right? So this is, this is out there. You'll see Monsanto says, here's where our, our site is where we produce it. I'm going to get to some of this, so let's, let's talk about it. No, it's okay. It's okay. Just keep watching just for a second as it got, get, gets going here, because it really was pretty remarkable. At this point, we really were a little bit kind of nervous, <laughs> again, as you think about it. Can I find it in the archives? In this case, no. They, again, Monsanto, you can go on a website, and they'll say that our soda spring, and this is what they'll talk about, is the number of jobs that they're employing the number of people that have work in this location and things like that. They're very upfront about this going on. I think that they know, though, that very few people are actually going to come out here to see what's going on. And um, so there you go. At that point, we were definitely a little nervous. <laughs> okay. Again, not knowing, I mean, you're, you're getting just heat off this, and not knowing a lot about radiological science, you're kind of like, well, is this good exposure right now, you know? And the horses behind us, we worried about them, too. My wife's a equestrian, so I got a little concerned about them. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every 15 minutes this happens. You can see the multiple will dump at different locations and just piles up, piles up, piles up, piles up. That's what you're seeing at the top of the hour. At the front of the plant, this is what you see, a kind of full representation of this. It looks kind of nice. You know, these like yellow flowers kind of coming out. But of course, this is problematic. Again, this is the production of elemental phosphorus, which is the key ingredient that it, it goes into production of Roundup. And this is Monsanto's key site where they do this. It is a super fun site that has been allowed to operate. And the arguments I've heard, I met, I got interviews with Monsanto engineers who are retired. He said that one of the reasons they've been allowed to operate despite all this waste and Superfund designation is because they made the argument that if they're not able to make money from production of Roundup, then how can they deal with the cleanup? 
All right, it's a, it's a really interesting <laughs> logic, but uh, I called up Region 10's EPA official and said, is this strange or is this normal? And you could tell by the kind of tone she said, this is unusual, you know, that this, this has been allowed to go on. So, uh, and I want to talk about all this too and have conversations, but let me just try and keep going. Again, this is, the, this is where the story of Roundup begins, and we're not talking about it. I think that's what's interesting is as folks who are interested in sustainable agriculture, we talk about the environmental cost of Roundup use on the back end, on farms, and affecting consumers if there's contaminated uh, food with Roundup in it. But we're not talking about producing the stuff in the first place. And I think that's uh, a really interesting question. Now, the story gets really fascinating because this waste that you're seeing for many years was actually sold to the town of Soda Springs and Pocatello nearby to build their sidewalks, their basements, their homes, their playgrounds, you name it. And this began in the 1950s when they would start selling this waste to the town because it's a great aggregate. It really works well for, for building foundations and things like that. The problem is, as we mentioned, it has high quantities of radium and, and, and is radioactive and emits gamma rays. And over 50%, according to the scientists I met with, over 50% of the homes in Soda Springs today still has this waste embedded in their foundation in Soda Springs. It was banned ultimately in the 1970s when people started kind of wising up to the fact that this stuff was particularly toxic and probably shouldn't be used to build homes. And if you think that's probably bad, so did the EPA. The EPA went out there in the 1980s and 1990s to do radiological surveys, um, aerial surveys of Pocatello and Soda Springs. And you're not going to be able to see this chart very clearly, but what they found was that there were hot spots like in the communities where this, not just where the plant was, but at these homes and all over the place. And in 1990, uh, the mayor of the town said it was a bombshell. What are we going to do about all this? The interesting story is that it's the, you'd think the town, it's like Love Canal, right? Revolt. And we want our, this cleaned up and we want our homes fixed. That's not how it works in Pocatello and Soda Springs. You got to understand that a lot of them, not maybe at this point, uh, say 1990s, close to a majority of the town, and you certainly say a large portion of the town is employed by Monsanto. We're talking about a town of 3,000 people, and so that's one of the reasons I went there. I think it's really important as environmental historians to get to know some of the folks that are there and hear their stories, because I don't think you're crazy in saying no EPA, which is what they did. They said EPA, get out of here, because they had bought homes. And they had invested in that real estate. We were talking about homes you know, today earlier. And, and that's a very important investment. And they were concerned that you know, exposing this or, or declaring the town, potentially even a super fun site itself, could be really bad for the community. And so they said, no, 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 EPA. We're going to try and work with Monsanto and the phosphate industries to deal with this. And today, you can actually go online. You can do this yourself and see the solution. The community worked with Monsanto and the EPA, the Public Health Department. FMC is another phosphate manufacturing facility in um, Soda Springs. To come up with a plan of how to deal with waste that is embedded in people's homes that, again, is radioactive. And I was somewhat stunned by the solutions because they didn't say come in and, you know, uh, clean up these homes. That was an option. It was mentioned kind of low down on the guidelines on this website. But most of the suggestions include, I kid you not, spend less time in your basement, right? The, the kind of socialization of cost that, that's going on here I think is really interesting and the ways in which people accept it in part because of their their connection literally to this problem because their their homes are filled with it and they have their own investment to think about, right? They're not crazy, but they're trying to figure out a solution to all of this. Yes, this is low levels of radiation. Too. I'm not, I don't want to blow this up to say, um, it, you know, these folks were high. We saw spikes in cancer rates. We didn't see that. 
But the EPA was very clear. It was significant enough to be of concern. And as they noted, we're not sure exactly what day-to-day -day interaction with this kind of radioactive material might in the long run, uh, how it might affect people's health. And so this became a really big issue. So radioactive homes was kind of part of the story. Let me tell you, again, like the caffeine chapter, I was not expecting this. To your point, this was on the website. I get out there, I'm like, whoa. This story is wild, and it gets even crazier. And I think it should make us think about this question of agricultural sustainability, right? Because the way – and this isn't just uh, Monsanto that pitches Roundup as an environmentally responsible weed control program that's part of a sustainable agriculture and environmental protection. There are a lot of people who are third parties that say this is true, that Roundup actually does, um, you know, cut down on weeding operations, which then cuts down on fuel and actually contributes to no-till farming, which is great. But I want us to talk about this. Roundup ready crops, genetically modified crops that are designed to be resistant to this herbicide. Is that truly a sustainable future? And I'm not here to debate this, because in recent years and months, the World Health Organization has really thrown a bombshell at all of this, suggesting that Roundup could be potentially a human carcinogen if it is found in residues in food or for farmers that are out there using this stuff every single day. This has been contested. You know, the EPA has looked into this, and this battle continues. And Monsanto is involved, challenging this, and that's a whole other scientific debate for a whole other talk. What I'm suggesting we think about is to move just to, to move beyond the back end and to think about the front end cost of producing these herbicides that, that are we're dependent upon for our food today. And you know, if radioactive homes aren't your thing, there's other stories. Because phosphate mining itself is an incredibly environmentally intensive process that does a lot of devastation, to be honest with you, to the land in southeast Idaho. And you can see, this is not a great map, I know, of many of the different mine sites. Most, a lot of these right here are owned by Monsanto. Some are owned by other facilities in southeast Idaho. And this is what it looks like. I mean, when you get out there, we're talking about miles and miles of open pit mines, phosphate mines where this stuff is being extracted. And these mine sites, many of the ones that are closed down for Monsanto, are also super fun sites because of the toxic uh, heavy metals that come off the overburden piles, the waste piles from mining all of this stuff. And one of the biggest issues is actually um, selenium, which is a trace element that's found naturally in the environment but is in high concentrations in phosphate ore. And when phosphate ore is processed and there's overburden piles out in those fields, the waste rock leaches selenium into um, streams and into fields that then soak up this stuff. It ends up in the grass. And one of the biggest problems is that we've seen uh, animals die in this region. Since 1996, over 600 heads of cattle and animals have died as a result of selenosis or of selenium poisoning, consuming grasses that are in high concentration in this waste. And it's very clear that that is linked to the phosphate mines. There's really no question about that. And the big issue has been how do we, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this problem that the EPA has declared much bigger than they ever thought when they first approved phosphate mining you know, decades earlier? Um, and it's a really intense issue because not only is it that the cattle are, are, are dying and animals as a result of this, there are streams, one of, the, one of which I tried to get on called the Blackfoot River that literally goes just 100 yards away, a couple hundred yards away from the mine site. And this is some of the most pristine cutthroat trout streams in the country. And um, I actually, I'm a kayaker, whitewater kayaker, so I tried to put in on the river to get as close to the mine sites as I can because you can't actually go to the mine sites. It's like a security state in these areas with you know, big fences and 
flashing lights. And so we saw this stream on the map, a friend of mine that starts in a national park, and we said, well, we can go to the national park, you know, and we can put our boat in and we can go through. Uh, stupid thing was, is we weren't actually in the national park when we did this. And a rancher came up and t t turned to my friend and said, saw our silly orange kayak boats, and said, uh, y'all aren't, aren't going in that river. And uh, we said, I remember saying, we need to get out of here. And my friend John was, it was like over his head. He's like, oh, is it polluted? You know? And he was like, <laughs> no, you're just not going in that river. Right? In other words, it, I want you to see that in the community itself, there is also a kind of sense that this is something that is uh, accepted, that the phosphate industry is something that's good for the community and brings in dollars and things like that. And that makes sense. And I actually was trying to listen to what I was hearing. Um, this is not the Love Canal story. I think it's a very different story. So anyway, that, that stream is also a big issue because these uh, fish and aquatic life. The question is, how are they being affected? The dead animals aren't your thing. Then we can talk about the air pollution as well. These facilities are incredibly energy intensive. And for energy history, I think this is really interesting. You have to heat up this phosphate ore to such high temperatures in order to, to purify and distill out elemental phosphorus, which is kind of this pure chemical, that you use incredible quantities of energy. I was stunned, even going back to the 1950s. Their initial plants used just one facility, this plant, used more power than the city of Memphis, Tennessee, back in the 50s. And today, this facility uses more power than the city of Salt Lake City, Utah. Just the facility. They even have their own, like, grid right behind that's pulling. And I asked where the energy comes from. I was really curious. And they said not from Bonneville Dam and, and that, but actually a lot of it's coming from coal power. So when we talk about the carbon footprint of Roundup Ready crops, how is this not part of the calculus, right, this this story. And as you can imagine, too, when you're, when you're doing this heating and cooking process, you're putting all sorts of pollutants into the air as well. And you might say, well, what types of pollutants? Well, mercury is a big, big, big issue at this particular plant. And as you all probably know, mercury is not a good thing. And in the state of Idaho, which doesn't have a lot of industry, I should point out, right, in terms of big manufacturing plants like this type of facility, we're talking about 659 pounds of mercury in 2006 out of the entire state, 684 pounds in this one location. So air pollution, you know, uh, the story of selenium pollution in the water and the, 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 the grasslands, radioactive waste that's piling up because you can't sell it to homes anymore. This is the story of Roundup's origin, and I, I don't think we're talking about that. We may know that the plan is there on, on the website, but I don't think we talk about this. So, what, I'm sorry, what is the octane permission interval? Um, this would be a significant increase in the amount of mercury in 2006. So this is their asking permission to hit 1,700 pounds. Yeah, so I think they, this was this was really interesting. I actually got to meet with the environmental organization um, that blew the whistle on this because the EPA apparently they were in violation with the Clean Air Act, which, by the way, is a whole other conversation about how businesses are able to violate the Clean Air Act and report it and basically go without it. So I believe, and I'm, I'm not sure what in this particular line what they were doing, but the Environmental Protection Agency got in a conversation with the environmental organization in Montana to, to talk about changing all this and, and getting approval. Um, ultimately, I think Monsanto tried to reshape their air monitoring and, and processing to try and deal with some of this, but it's still a real question for this community. And I, and I want to just end by saying the other big point here, I think that when we talk about sustainable agriculture, is like regardless of all that story and waste, there's a basic kind of fifth grade reality here, which is that phosphate rock, like fossil fuels, is a finite resource. And at some point, and peak phosphate, much like peak oil, is a conversation in industry when will it be, 2030, 2040, 2050? I mean, I don't want to get involved in the, in the bet, you know, uh, when those things will happen. But we do know at some point, like with oil, we will not be able to extract this stuff and process it. So then what? Right? If this is truly a sustainable system, I think that fundamentally kind of throws a real kink into that argument. You're making crops genetically modified to be resistant to a chemical that comes from an inherently kind of unsustainable process. 
And I think instead of looking at the back end, which I think is what we focus on so much, is this stuff contaminating wildlife. And I think that's a, it's important research. We need to be doing it. We need to be looking at the front end of this stuff too, right? How it's made in the first place. So that's the kind of conversation maybe we could all have. And how do we define it? You know, what do we mean when we talk about sustainable agriculture? And and how are we including this front end story in the calculus? My, I'd suggest that we're not talking enough about that. Um, so I appreciate uh, you all, all coming out, and hopefully we can have kind of a fun conversation. Thank you very much. We have plenty of time for questions, so just ask that you identify yourself and uh, this question. We'll try to keep on track. Hey, Calvin. Yeah. Sure. So the question is essentially, why is it that uh, you know Monsanto can burn? I like how you put it, Kevin. Can burn phosphate rock here and violate all these EPA regulations, but us as private citizens don't have that same ability. They seem to be getting exemptions that other folks don't. I actually don't think it's as complicated as, as we think. I think it's, it's, it's actually somewhat of a simple story, which is the story of Coke, what I came to see, and I'm going to probably find the same with Monsanto, I'm still in the beginning phases of this, is the, the ways in which they embed themselves in the regulatory agencies and get the ear of these regulatory agencies to shape policy. Monsanto is clearly there. You know, when uh, the decisions are being made about how biotechnology and gene genetically modified crops are going to be regulated. And actually, uh, Bush Sr. is meeting with Monsanto officials, and there's a video online, you can see it yourself, where he's walking around and say, you know, we'd really appreciate it if y'all didn't have special regulations regarding GMOs. And he says, call me, you know, call me when I'm in the White House. I'm in the DREG business, right? So, and I think Trump, I think even most recently, has been meeting with Monsanto officials as well. And I think that, that access to power, which I think is created over time. In the case of Coke, it was extremely deliberate. Um, Coke picked people that were in the State Department, you know, to come and work for them because they knew that that would be a great access to, to that um, agency and to be able to shape it. Um, and in the case of the coca leaves, that's exactly what happened. So I think part of the story is um, that access that they have that we don't, which is a question about democracy and a much lar larger history of how we've uh, lost the power to influence uh, politics and how big money shapes those decisions. And uh, it's almost too easy, but I, I really think that's a big part of both of these stories with Coke and Monsanto. Yeah, it's a really amazing story. Um, it was a it was a business. This is a very business history story. They had a dilemma, which was they had invested in this these really capital intensive facilities that again it required tremendous amounts of energy. And I should mention that the original phosphate manufacturing facility they had was in Tennessee, in a town called Monsanto. Uh, it was originally Columbia, Tennessee, and the name went back to Columbia, Tennessee in the 1960s. I, I'm making the argument. I'm not, I can't prove it yet. But they kind of figured out, well, wait a minute. Once you create a toxic waste site, maybe it's not good to have your name on the town, you know? <laughs> so they moved from Tennessee because it's, it's, a story, it's a classic story of extraction and depletion and having to move. And they go out to southeast Idaho, and let's be clear, this is in the 30s and 40s and 50s. They're not producing Roundup yet. Roundup's going to be introduced in the 1970s. So what's interesting is this, so what are they doing phosphate? It's actually phosphoric acid, which is one of the reasons I kind of got into this, is one of the things that they're producing is phosphoric acid for Coca-Cola as well. 
and it was one that I actually left out of the book because I was trying to finish the book and I thought phosphoric acid, well, how, how important is it? I'm showing you all my skeletons. I should have included that in the book because it's, it's an interesting story. Phosphoric acid and other phosphate-based products. And the biggest thing, actually, the biggest thing they were producing was phosphate-based detergent. And uh, their first, if you use all, that's Monsanto. Monsanto created all. That was one of their first branded all detergents, uh, washing detergent. That was their first branded kind of item that they sold. And so they, they were killing it. It was one of their biggest product lines in the 50s. Interesting thing starts developing, though, is dissertation and issues with Lake Erie and complaints about phosphate based things affecting waterways. And there are all these proposed bans on this. And this is happening right at the 70s. And they're saying, oh, man, we have all this infrastructure and phosphate, which is taking up 50% of their phosphate production at that point. And basically, it was very clear that they were going to have to go to a non-phosphate-based detergent. What to do? And actually, as they put it, they put down, I found the archival document where he says it was a strategic exit. At the exact same time, we discovered that the glyphosate stuff through our uh, kind of research and development lab could, could be used as a great weed killer. Boom. And so this thing that used to be phosphate detergent, from a business history standpoint, they're like, great, we'll just switch over to Roundup. And now, you know, Roundup became, I think they, it was like $2 billion in revenue. I mean, it was just, this is one of their biggest uh, sellers even today um, for the company. So it kind of saved them. That's somewhat of the origin story there. <laughs> You're talking about the relationship between capitalism and business. I saw some of that. Um, what's your presentation about um, environmental problems associated with production of these chemical foods that you're um, having a complaint about? Don't worry about how we don't pay enough attention to the problems associated with production. But I want to ask if you have any lessons you can offer. Occasionally, some of the pollution issues that we dealt with in the 1950s have been partially, if not fully, resolved. And over time, when enough uh, citizens and government agencies pay attention to one of these problems, we sometimes will eventually tackle it. There's all kinds of inertia, and it's difficult to overcome the economic stake that communities have, as was pointed out. Um, but we do make progress occasionally. What are what what lessons can you offer about how we make progress? Yeah. The levers that, that get us to solve these kinds of problems. I don't know how you figured out that that's what's driving you because that's that's the question, right? And, and one of the things I'd say is this is not a book about Monsanto. This is as much as a book about the EPA, and not just the EPA, but the systems that we have not put in place to force industries to, to deal with the pollution that they're generating. In other words, if there's one lesson I think we see in environmental history. And that is unfolding through the stories I'm writing about these businesses. It's a very, it's another kind of simple one, Calvin. It's, it's that the thing I keep seeing over and over is that we don't force businesses to pay for the pollution they're generating in this country. And, and, the, and this is what I think is so interesting, is that simultaneously we're told that businesses are the engines of creativity and they can do all these great things. And I, I don't necessarily disagree. There's a, there's a remarkable <laughs> ability to innovate and marshal capital to do great things. But the moment that you say, well, wait a minute, uh, in my chapter on recycling, I talk about the mandatory deposit, five to 10 cent um, tax, essentially, that you put on a container so that people, you know, in California and other places, when you return that can, you get an actual, you know, five to 10 cents back. And you look and see in those places where you put a price on pollution, wow, reclamation rates are through the roof. We don't do that in so many other areas, right? We don't put that pressure on it. And what's interesting is industry fights that and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. We can't deal with that five to 10 cents, right? That's the lobbying they'll do. Well, wait a minute, you just said 
this great innovator and you could do all anything, but that five to 10 cents would crush your industry, you'd lose jobs and, you know, so there's this kind of perverse logic that business is all powerful. And yet when those things come up, it's like business is so weak and innovative that even if you put that little price on us, we would sink. And so I think we've got to fight through that logic. And I think we've got to say, what would have happened in Soda Springs if the EPA had said, fix it? You know, this is, the, this is not acceptable. This radioactive waste is piling up and piling up. No, you can't. Figure out another way to produce your roundup. And I would go to the business people and say, I do believe in war. The engineer I met actually right in my chapter. I said, I wonder what the world would have looked like if Mitch had been given that task. You know, he's a smart mathematician. He knows how to do things. And if he was pushed to say, no, this is unacceptable on, you know, this is polluting, killing livestock and affecting people, find another path. Um, I think so often we give up on that path and we go the easy route. So I think it comes down to how do we put those pressures on? Is it through the EPA? And so the last thing I'd say is this, and I'm so excited about your question is, in an era in which Scott Pruitt may be our administrator, then the question becomes, well, Bart, that's, that's a fairy tale, because you're not going to get that kind of pressure. And so one of the things I'm doing at Ohio State is, is piloting what we're calling SED, the Columbus Environmental Digital Project, which is using technology students and professors in our class to become our own little mini EPA, monitoring our environment and our community with our class. So we have classes of 30 to 40 students. Um, my students each pick a, um, a quadrant of the city, and they're responsible for tracking and monitoring what's going on in that community. And this involves hydrologists and other departments, the mass spectrometers in the chemistry department, and we're doing it. And I think if you think about universities around the country, they're everywhere. We can do it if we grasp, if we, if we create a way of monitoring and being the watchdog. Because as this lady was mentioning, the EPA prior to Scott Pruitt doesn't have the resources or the capability of doing it, and it has it done. So I think um, thinking about how we can turn universities into echo watchdogs. I think that's a really interesting question in an era when the EPA, it may not even exist, you know? So. Time for one or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have time for one or two more questions. Yeah. 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 Fertilizers. Yep. F and C. And almost all of that left in Florida. Yep. So I should be clear. Um, you know, this is a book about Monsanto, so this is a chapter of that story of Monsanto. And you're right. The, the much bigger story about phosphate is what's going on in the fertilizer industry and in Florida and all these other places. But I'm, you know, my focus is a, this is just part of a story looking at Monsanto. And so you're, I think it's really important in a group that might not have as much familiar, familiarity with phosphate to just point out that this is a small part of your, that larger story over here. But I think it tells us a very important story about the failure of regulation over time. I mean, think about this. This NPL listing, National Priority Listing, Superfund listing, was 1989. You know? And this, I mean, when you see, as I say at the very end, I stood before, uh, you know, a pile of waste that's towered above me. I said decades of us attempting to create a sustainable agriculture, uh, sustainable herbicide. And I, could, I was anything but optimistic, you know? It, 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 I think there's something to say about that story, and you're absolutely right. I'm not suggesting that somehow this is the only story in the phosphate story. In fact, hopefully this will point people towards that other, those other areas. Um, and actually, I should say, I thought I was going to Florida because I grew up in Georgia, and I knew about all the phosphate mining in Florida, and I thought that's where I was going to go. And that's what's so funny about these stories. I was like, wait a minute, Mons Monsanto chose to go out to southeast Idaho. And it was partially because Mosaic and these other companies ended up being such bigger players in those areas. So totally agree with you. It's a small part of a larger phosphate story. But I think for Monsanto, it's a really interesting story that reveals a lot about the failure of regulation. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, I think it's it's going to ruin the title of the book. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the first thing I thought of. Um, you know, and it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, unfortunately, as you can imagine, it's it's so fresh, and I'm I'm deep back in the 50s and 60s right now, and a lot of it, so this is kind of interesting. People keep talking about these things. They want to talk about GMOs. I'm not there. You know, as a researcher, I'm actually as a historian, I want to see sequence. I think it's so important to understand how things kind of develop and then talk about it. So this will be, you know, let's just be optimistic next year, uh, no, the year after, right, where I start really diving into this merger, you know, if it all materializes in the way that, um, you know, it's planned. So I think it's going to be a really interesting story. I think it's the obvious thing I'd point out is that it's another example of this incredible consolidated control over, over the food system. And I think that, is, you know, regardless of what people, I'll probably have interesting debates about GMOs and people who raise their hand and say, does it cause a third year, you know, and I don't want to go down the routes of kind of the, just being, you know, just being uh, kind of myths and legends, but I think that you can hang your hat on this one, you know, that we have seen this incredible control over the food system and the seed supply, and that's, the question would be why Monsanto, maybe, is because, you know, the largest seed distributor, genetically modified seed distributor, and that to me was just like, that needs explaining. And the, actually, the new subtitle, I should just say this, is no longer how the quest for power changed the world. It's how is it, and this gets also, how is it that a company that produced PCBs, and the chapter I'm writing right now is Agent Orange, and uh, DDT, and some of the, the things that have caused all sorts of different environmental issues, survive to feed the world? I think that's a fundamental question. Like, how is it that our system allowed for that to happen? And seed money, the name of the book, is not just saying seed money that's clever, okay, there's seed, you know. How did they get the seed money? How did they survive? Like, capitalism question, right? To be there, to be in a position to make these mergers and become these big guys. I think that's the question. Great question. One right here. Sure, if you can repeat that, it'll be live stream. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, how would you rephrase it so I could rephrase it? Well, short. <laughs>
that, what content is being sent them, how those stories are told by the users of that content that they're interacting with. And, you know, that, that's a more challenging task than things that are required. So, I, so I wonder if you were maybe, maybe, to yeah, maybe I could get at it. Kind of think it's a great question. It's, it's, I might be able to at least. No, that's okay. I, I, maybe I get at it, and I don't know how, if I'll try and rephrase it as I answer it maybe a little bit. I, maybe it's a, who is telling the story? Who gets to tell the story? I think that's an interesting question, and because I do think there's different, you know, my brother sends me pictures all the time of people with tattoos, or not tattoos, but images that say, Mon Satan, you know, and that, 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 that he's in Alaska, so that's kind of popular. I don't know, in, in certain sections, you know, in Cisco and other places, not as much, but um, there are different perceptions of this, but one of the things that I'm tracing is actually the ways in which the federal state is telling the story of progress. And to your point, like that message is being sent from the White House, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. So I just wrote a chapter that um, is on kind of presidential policy in GMOs. And what I wanted to see was like, okay, what's, we know the kind of story of the Reagan administration and Dan Quayle's involvement in shaping the regulatory regime that was very favorable to the production of GMOs. But what happened beyond that? And what you see is like Bush, Clinton, and Obama, all of them preaching to the world that this is the salvation from famine, you know, that this is the solution. And I've tried to complicate that by saying, well, how is it being distributed? The idea is that we're going to provide this, this technology that will empower these communities to change their lives and feed themselves. But at the very same time, you know, there's the Convention of Biological Diversity, uh, a treaty that comes out in 1992, which had called for nations in developing countries to be able to have open access to biotechnology advancements and technology and education and training programs and things like that. And Bush was, uh, Bush Senior was extremely opposed to this because he said it's anti-capitalist. You know, we, if we just give away, as he put it, these technologies and allow this open sharing of biotechnology and genetically modified crops, well, then, you know, we're going to stifle innovation and we're not going to be able to create these new technologies that are going to save the world. And so the result is then what we see, right? Like this kind of, it's still a very colonial relationship in terms of how this is sold to nations. It's sold as liberation and freedom, but it's coming from the most consolidated businesses that the world has ever seen. And I think that's an interesting question. Yeah, but then you've also given us, sorry, Chris Joe, history. You've also given us evidence that from the bottom up, there's actually buy-in among average people there who even pay some of the cost of it, that they consider that worth it. And so an easy answer is to just say, as many people who are in the School of Sustainability would like to say about the American electorate, electorate that there's false consciousness. But if we try and move beyond that and say these people are – what if these people aren't just stupid or more misinformed or false consciousness, but have deeply differentiated, grounded sets of what's right and wrong? How do you tell the story in a way that that enables someone in Soda Springs to hear the story, have it match up with their life, that doesn't sort of essentially just cast them as a someone who has false consciousness and doesn't understand what's going on. Right, which is what I'm trying to do, right? Trying to give the full humanity back to these players and actors in this town. The first version of this chapter, I think they did come off that way. It was like, why are these Soda Springs people not rioting and not revolting? And then by going to the community and getting to know like their investments and you know, how many people are employed with them and listening to the public hearing. They had a public hearing in the high school there in Soda Springs when this happened. And just listening to their voices, like, I, I think you're right. I mean, part of this is about showing that um, the ways in which these big corporations have embedded themselves in local communities. I think it's so easy for us to say, well, like Coke, for example. Um, why is it that, you know, Coke is able to go into India and extract water at such a high rate in Rajasthan, where I travel to, that it can affect people's water table? And the answer, I think, has, I've come to find is the ways in which Coca-Cola capitalism, as I like to call it, embeds itself in those communities. The bottler in that town is a local businessman. Right, who makes the argument to his friends and people there. He's like, this isn't Coke doing this. This is our, and this is your jobs. And this is, you know, I'm the face of Coca-Cola in those places. And that's one of the reasons why Coke was so successful, I think, was that they were able to find local, tap into local social capital and political capital by pulling those folks in. 
And so I don't know if I'll ever be able to convince the Soda Springs people that they might they might have taken a different path or or vote differently. Um, I actually looked at the voting turnout in that area, and it, it was about 75% for Trump in the last election in that particular area. And that certainly colored their response as well. And they basically said, we don't want the big government coming in here and doing this. Um, so will I be able to change their political mindset to say, no, actually, you know, can you imagine a world in which regulators would be tougher on this industry, but it would innovate in ways that could do all these great things? I don't know. Um, but, but I certainly want to give them their full humanity in the story. I don't want them to come off as they're just stupid and not, you know, responding to the health of those concerns that they should be. Um, so this is a stuff of, of complicated history. View them as kind of brought out already, though, because they've got the same amount of funding for that colors their opinion greatly, and maybe they don't have a view of what the rest of the world is doing or afraid of coming and through it or their bodies or art in their own. I would probably feel, you know, what would they do if I lived there in my big black nice house? And right. Right. Yeah, no, and I, I understand the, the, the way they went about it. Um, the other, I actually tried to figure out, well, why did Love Canal work differently? I mean, one of the reasons why Love Canal worked differently was because Hooks Chemical Company was gone. Right. And like, so trying to answer these questions of why is it in some places we're seeing certain activism versus other places. Part of it is that in some of these places, you still have the chemical company as the main paycheck giver in town. And um, kind of being clear about that is and understanding the kind of micro histories that are shaping environmental activism or not activism, I think is important. Um, but yeah. Well, we're at the end of our time. Um, and we can let the conversation continue informally. We have to whisk, by the way, for a seminar another 15 minutes, so please do stick around and uh, speak with him if you have time. Um, people agree with me that he's definitely animated the issue and complicated this critical juncture between environment and capitalism with this uh, fascinating story from Tampa. So thank you, Byron. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you.